other friends from the media fraternity and uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we are here to talk about uh, media, telecom, and bandwidth related issues. And especially the crossroads of regulation and consumer welfare. First of all, I would like to thank uh, Fiki Frames uh, for providing me with this opportunity to speak on a topic that is most relevant to the media and the telecom sector, especially at a time when we are witnessing a massive shift in the nature of content consumption and the wide availability of avenues to consume such content. At the same time, the surge in data consumption, largely led by a young audience, calls for better and more organized regulatory framework in an environment driven by the scope for a strong regulatory overlap between telecom and media. With media and entertainment sector expected to reach humongous 2.8 trillion by next year, the regulatory responsibility of those driving the sector becomes paramount, and the key principles of such regulatory framework should take into account the diverse consumer profile and its spending capabilities on the one hand and uplifting the regulatory standards on the other. The digitalization of television and the emergence of new media devices have redefined the broadcast landscape. The features offered by digital television, like the personalization of content, the accompanying interactivity, and the technical capabilities of the new media platforms have thrown up a world of new opportunities as well as challenges to all the existing and upcoming stakeholders, which includes the content creators, the broadcasters, the distributors, the application developers, the CP manufacturers, etc., to reach out and catch the eyeballs or the eardrums of the viewers or listeners. At the same time, the importance of telecom players in such a dynamic environment cannot be ignored as the torchbearers of infrastructure, which enables the seamless consumption of this content. This emerging ecosystem is posing a great challenge to the traditional broadcasters, whether terrestrial or satellite. The terrestrial broadcasters need to evolve, innovate, and reach out to the audience through multiple platforms by also using the new media platforms to complement the services rendered through the traditional broadcasting systems. This requires a considerable commitment of resources on the emerging platforms and technologies while sustaining the traditional linear broadcast infrastructure. OTT services, digital cable, and DTH operators are presently competing to occupy more space in the broadcasting industry for the distribution of content. These platforms have their own USPs. OTT services have caused disruption to the traditional broadcasting services and are becoming more and more popular, especially in the urban areas. As the services are using internet connections, they can be accessed anywhere. Many DTH operators are providing access to their services through OTT as well to complement their traditional services and keeping their consumers with them. However, the requirement of reliable high-speed broadband is limiting their reach. This further calls for enhanced harmony between media and telecom. The market is now segmenting into pay TV, free TV, and connected TV. Each platform is sizable in itself, and as we saw earlier today at the time of the release of the report, that each of these platforms seems to be well entrenched and growing. Therefore, the content producers, broadcasters, and distributors will have to address the needs of each of these groups for better monetization of their services. The free television, DD Free Dish, etc., are also growing their base. Another competing element in the broadcast media ecosystem of late has been the entry of telecom operators. The demands for spectrum by telecom service providers to roll out 4G, LTE, etc., and 5G and wireless video streaming services has put a lot of pressure on the broadcasters, and a sizable part of the spectrum hitherto used by the latter has seen diversion. This has compelled broadcasters to look for better compression technologies and competing solutions and standards. While allocating spectrum to the telecom operators and other wireless service providers, 
There's a need to keep the spectrum reserved for broadcasters to roll out D2M, HDTV, and other innovative services. As TRI has rightly recommended in one of its consultation papers, to accommodate new services and the evolving marketplace, many countries are modifying their policy making and regulatory frameworks, and institutions addressing the phenomenon of convergence of broadcast and telecom industries. One of the ways this has been achieved is by merging different regulatory authorities for telecom and broadcasting into one regulatory body. Large economies around the world, like the USA, UK, Australia, EU, etc., have established converged regulators who are empowered and made responsible for overseeing the complete electronic communication space, which includes telecom, broadcast, media, and cyberspace. <coughs> they have a common body that authorizes or provides licenses for both telecom and broadcast services. In light of the above, but also keeping into account India's situation and landscape, we are at a, at a stage now where we are ideally suited to discuss, debate, and draw from the best of international practices, keeping in view the specific Indian set of challenges, consumer profiles, and stakeholders. I'm not going into the technical part of it, but uh, issues of uh, leakage, issues of uh, the 5G services interfering with satellite uh, services and so on and so forth are well known. I think some of my other colleagues here will also touch upon them. So thank you very much for this opportunity. Uh, I will now uh, hand over to the moderator and let's listen to what my other co-panelists have to say. Thank you. Thank you, sir. It's, it's indeed been a long journey from uh, coaxial or copper cables to optic fiber, and uh, a lot of what you said alludes to that. Uh, can we also hear from you, uh, Mr. Sanjeev Shankar? So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my friends on the dais, uh, friends from the media in the hall, ladies and gentlemen. So I will uh, try to confine myself to the ongoing debate uh, between the uh, TSPs, that is the telecom service providers, uh, and the OTT players, the OTT apps, on the issue of uh, sharing of the cost and the debate around it. So the fair share uh, issue and the debate. So. Eric Smith, former CEO of Google, once described the internet as the largest experiment in anarchy that we have ever had. Indeed, the internet has revolutionized the way we communicate. We all know that. OTT applications facilitated by internet protocols have decoupled content from carriage, empowering service providers to directly reach end user communication networks. So this decoupling has allowed these OTT players to ride on a ready-made infrastructure. So herein lies the issue. In this evolving landscape, OTT services like WhatsApp, Instagram, Telegram, Skype have emerged as a formidable competitors to the traditional telecom service services, leveraging the same infrastructure laid down by telecom service providers. Yet, they do not directly compete with the services governed by telecom licenses. This dichotomy poses profound questions about regulation, competition, and consumer welfare. The rise of broadband internet has been meteoric in India. We know that this is witnessing exponential growth in the past decade. However, amidst this transformative shift, Regulatory challenges loom large. The debate over the regulatory framework for OTT services has been ongoing, with stakeholders grappling to strike a balance between fostering innovation and ensuring a level playing field. TRI's consultation, and we have a, our friend from TRI, 
on OTT regulation underscore the complexities inherent in this space, calling for a nuanced approach that considers international precedents and emerging regulatory paradigms. Central to this discourse is the principle of net neutrality, which advocates for equal treatment for all internet traffic. Imposing carriage fees on OTT services could potentially undermine this principle. This is uh, one side of the argument, creating a tiered internet where larger players enjoy preferential treatment, stifling competition and innovation. It is argued that importance of upholding net neutrality and not only to preserve an open internet, but also to foster innovation and competition that has to be taken care of. Moreover, the imposition of carriage fees, we know that in the broadcasting sector, we have a carriage fees. Can we bring that template in, uh, in the relationship between the telecom operators and the o uh, OTT players also? So the imposition of carriage fees may have, this is another side of the argument, that adverse consequences for consumers leading to increased costs and reduced choice. Critics argue that such fees could hamper innovation and competi competition in this streaming industry, favoring larger players at the expense of smaller ones. Furthermore, the attempt by telecom companies to double dip by charging both consumers and content providers raises concerns about fairness and market integrity. So as we navigate through these challenges, it is imperative to adopt a holistic view. What is suggested by most is that a coll collaborative framework that encourages dialogue between OTT providers and telecom operators are essential to address regulatory uncertainties and promoting a thrival digital economy. So the uh, collaborative framework which is being talked about, they can take care of one or many of these suggested points. One is that the creating and enabling environment to encourage competition, innovation, investment in the digital economy then OTT and network operators remain critically inter interdependent to each other. So that has to be understood carefully. We should continue to foster entrepreneurship and innovation on OTT application side. So it is not that if a carriage fee is imposed, uh, that stifles innovation in the OTT application side. If situation allows, then voluntary commercial arrangements between telecom network operators and OTT providers may be encouraged. There are instances in the uh, international arena of such mm, examples. A regulatory impact assessment, some people suggest that before we take a plunge in the regulatory field, there should be a regulatory impact assess assessment uh, so that the interference is proportionate and minimal. Emerging online regulations are required to address online consumer protection, data privacy, and cyber security. So these are the points which I needed, I thought would be relevant for this discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you also for uh, jumping into the heart of the matter. Uh, no skirting around the fair share. But I do want to take, uh, you know, a step back first uh, and turn to uh, the infrastructure players um, on the uh, stage today, starting with you, Mr. Rahul Watts, for no other reason that you're proximate to me. Uh, but, you know, what does the future or next generation telecom infrastructure look like, Mr. Watts? Because it's important to situate this discussion uh, within your concept of the future, and we will see if that is something that the rest of the panel agrees with. Sure. So, uh, let me start by saying that uh, uh, the very basic layer for connectivity is how the telecom really started out. Uh, it was about peer-to-peer uh, -peer communication. The earliest forms were voice. That was the primary usage. We graduated towards edge, GPRS, better speeds, uh, more communication. Then we graduated towards uh, 3G, 4G, and then eventually we are on the 5G front. Uh, the technology life cycles have really shortened. For example, uh, the 3G, uh, we set up the network. It was hardly on for two years, and uh, the network had to be shut down. You have made investments, but that's it. Then we graduated towards 4G, and now we have done 5G. 
Uh, what has happened with 5G is that uh, you suddenly have humongous amount of capabilities available to you. Uh, and uh, as anybody will know, what 5G allows us is a very huge supercomputing skill. It's like a supercomputer connected to a network. It can connect millions of devices. It can give you a huge amount of computing data. A large part of the analysis which we are now getting into AI, et cetera, is actually because of the innovations which have happened in the chipset, in the data you're getting, and on the processing you're getting. Now, what does all this mean? What all this means is that today, you have got a very large network which is available, not only to connect yourself, but also to do very large amount of processing uh, in terms of what you are doing, which leads us to a lot of possibilities uh, in terms of governance, in terms of applications, in terms of going to the villages, in terms of connecting people, connecting businesses. Uh, the generations till now were more about connecting B2C, but increasingly now the enterprise space is what is going to open up, the capabilities which it opens up, and large amount of services which are now able to overlay on the basic connectivity layer opens up the opportunities uh, for a lot of stakeholders, a lot of people, a lot of startups to be able to do a lot of services, which is already happening. So this skill of supercomputing now adds on to this layer of 5G, and that opens up the opportunity of what future is going to look like. Thank you for that concise answer. If I can turn it over to you, Mr. Gandhi. Same question. Uh, Mr. Watts suggests that there is a lot of bandwidth uh, which needs to find utilization. Uh, other than this facet, which uh, you can choose to disagree with, uh, what is it in India that is uncommon or common to other major jurisdictions that are involved in this sort of next generation infrastructure rollout? Thanks. Uh, I agree with Rahul. Uh, it's basically the bandwidth. Mic. Uh, the the bandwidth increase in bandwidth, I think, is leading to convergence. Okay, whether it is uh, so the one-way communication is, I think, getting outdated, and two-way communication. Uh, can be supported because of the kind of bandwidths which are there. It's not that the bandwidth need to be filled. Bandwidth has become available because of the technological innovations which has happened. More and more infrastructure has been uh, installed. More spectrum has been put into the use, which has created enormous bandwidth, which can be used for both uh, uh, communication as well as for the uh, the entertainment media content. So that's how the technological evolution is changing the way uh, uh, the whole dynamics and economics of the, uh, uh, the business, basically. Um, Mr. Abbas, given that we have actually, this is a privileged position we are in, in the telecom space and internet space, that we have a lot of bandwidth, uh, and organically we will find use cases. But from the point of view of a regulator, you have a very specific set of mandates from the TRA Act. How do you look at the public interest in network infrastructure over the next few years? What will drive it? What will be the key dimension? Is access going to continue to be, you know, and over the last 75 years, you know, we've seen in infrastructure that has been the predominant vector for regulators, line ministries, governments, for policy making. Uh, or is it going to be some other dimension, whether it be quality of service, uh, you know, finding these use cases, et cetera? Thank you. So uh, digital infrastructure and digital network is the most important thing which is required for the country. And uh, given the situation in India where the fixed line broadband penetration is very low, only 37 million broadband uh, fixed line broadband is available, so mobile network is the only network which is reaching to the masses, giving the ubiquitous connectivity throughout the country. So therefore, uh, enhancing the capacity, enhancing the outreach, and enhancing the scope and use cases of the mobile network is of prime importance, particularly for India. Because that is the only network which is being used for digital economy, for the entire digitalization of the processes and activities which the businesses, enterprises, and individuals are doing. So basically, more investment is required in the mobile network so as to 
obtain the ubiquitous connectivity. Even for 5G also, 4G is already available throughout Pan India, very good speed also, but 5G is over and above, overlaying the network or 5G and giving the higher speed, higher capacity than the 4G. So gradually, when the more investment will be there in the 5G network, we will get more and more speed, more and more capacity. And beyond the individual use cases, they can serve the enterprises, they can serve the private network, they can serve the various 5G use cases for across all the industry verticals. Thank you. Nikhil, uh, this use case is a recurring theme. And before we jump into fair share, um, do we have a fair share of use cases? Are we at a peak demand moment? When are we going to reach like the equivalent of peak oil in you know, peak demand in, in network infrastructure terms? You are close to some of the developments in the AI sphere as well as applications that take uh, large bandwidth. What is your view on this when you look around the Indian landscape? I think that, uh, Vivan, if you look at internet usage and the use case, we're only just beginning. Frankly, if you look at it, most of the internet in this country uh, is still in English. And for me, the day this country will change from a computing perspective is when AI will enable someone, let's say, in Maharashtra to write a prompt in Marathi, and that will convert it into code and con convert it into an app. So the promise of the internet is really enabling every single individual to not just be a consumer, but also a creator. And you know, this space, I've been coming here for 15 years now, is a testament to the power of the creative economy. And that creative economy today has gone outside, the, outside of the space to every village in this country, thanks to, to be honest, players like Geo. Because let's not forget, back then there was a literally a, almost like a uh, coordinated operation of uh, Airtel Idea and Vodafone that would not open up high speed bandwidth. Geo came and completely revolutionized access. Free internet for six months changed India's internet landscape, coupled with the TRAI's historic judgment on net neutrality, which ensured that everyone doesn't have to go to a telecom op operator to seek permission to create. Otherwise, yahan pe, you know, just to put up an OTT player, you would have liked you have to go to a cable operator to negotiate to put up a TV channel. You would have had to go to a uh, telecom operator to start an OTT player. Okay. So, so I'm not going into network UGC, but I'm saying the I, I wrote an article in the Hindu once saying that the internet allows us every, us to have a billion TV channels online. Cable will never allow that. And so it's a testament to not just from an OTT perspective. And I want to talk a little bit about broadcast and OTT, if you don't mind, because I think there is a real tension right now between, and which is key to this panel, between telecom uh, and INB in terms of who owns OTT? And we saw that in the initial telecom bill and we've seen that in the broadcast bill. The problem is neither of them do and they shouldn't simply because what you have on OTT is private viewing. You know, I was in the Supreme Court when Mukul Rodhgi went and said that even watching porn is a private activity and so we don't want to regulate. Content is being viewed privately on devices and screens in the privacy of our bedrooms. It's not broadcast. So how OTT fits into a broadcast construct rationally doesn't make sense. Telecom, though, it's no scope. Just two points, one on this side. One is private viewing. The other is that neither ministry can decide who owns it because someone, some, we're working at the telecom ministry, in my opinion, is working with an archaic notion of that uh, coupling of broadcast and, and telecom, also coming from DTH perspective, right? But the internet is very different. Brought, the internet has, uh, to use a phrase that R.S. Sharma used to use quite a bit, has uh, led to the unbundling of content and services. So when we move forward as an ecosystem in treating access and content as separate entities, and you need to have separate regulations, separate regulators, and separate ministries for content and carriage, 
I don't understand why this suddenly this both types of carriage ministries are trying to own content. Okay, so hold that the thought, Nikhil. Third, we'll come. We'll come to it on the second on the round. We are opening all the cans that we need to open. No, no. What telecom ki baat alag hai? Just one last bit on broad, broadcast. In it is the IT rules which try to regulate uh, online services. Uh, content services under the IT Act are themselves illegal because the IT Act doesn't give it the power to do it. So there is a confused situation in terms of online streaming services today in this country because one, a set of rules are illegal. Secondly, ministries can't decide who owns okay. it. So we'll and come frankly, back to this. Anything. Coming back to network infrastructure and the infrastructure being the core, whether it is converging or not converging, uh, what is the market failure, Mr. Watts, that fair use is seeking to remedy, given what Nikhil has said in part about the proliferation of the app ecosystem and the creative economy and um, you know, the general consumer welfare associated with all of these developments naturally? So uh, Nikhil can have his views, and so can everybody else. That's fine. Uh, you see, I think... Uh, uh, let's just see two or three things. It's very fancy to say that things opened on a particular day, that life changed today, uh, that from tomorrow this will happen. But as you see, uh, life is continuum. You had 2G, that is why you had another layer coming up of 3G. You had 4G, that is why you have 5G. Creation of network infrastructure which leads to benefits to society and governance. That's the real model, how it works. Now let's come back to uh, what is happening. What is happening is that over a period of 25 years in this country, uh, we have seen uh, various technology life cycles. We have seen operators going from 2 to 14, back to 4. We have seen investments being poured, foreign investors come, foreign investors go. We have also seen the creation of the fastest ever 5G rollout in the country, which has not happened anywhere in the world. That is the fact. Everybody knows. Now, all the discussion which has started out, and by the way, this is not a discussion which is uh, started in India. The discussion has started all across the globe. It has started in Korea, it has started in Europe, it has started in Brazil, and it has started in India. And what is the discussion about? Discussion is about that you are today creating a large amount of infrastructure, and is the infrastructure we are creating sustainable enough to be able to continue the growth of that infrastructure all across? The huge amount of capability, skills, infrastructure proliferation, which is going to ride on a network, are we creating sustainable networks which will be able to, on which all the applications are going to ride? And how that ecosystem should really grow and proliferate? That is what I think the core discussion is. The discussion is only around, can we create sustainable networks for the future? So, Mr. Gandhi, taking this thought forward, you have currently, as um, uh, Mr. Shankar was saying, it's important for collaboration basically as a mantra in the digital space. And collaboration's been happening, right? Market participants are basically trading with each other in one way or the other, whether they're interconnecting, peering, you know, partnering in whatever way. So what is the need for an intervention in this process of, you know, a market determined uh, sustainable equilibrium, so to say, to take forward Mr. Mr. Watts's point on the fact that we are, we are trying to preempt something that will happen in the future. Why can't the market preempt it, as it has so far? I, uh, uh, I think I would uh, uh, start from what Nikhil said, this decoupling. Actually, uh, this whole OTT discussion revolves around the issue of decoupling because the internet has allowed the services to be decoupled from the network. Prior to internet, it was not there. The voice was coupled with the network. SMS was coupled with the network, but it has allowed that to happen. Coupled with the greater bandwidth with 5G and 4G uh, has actually led to a creation of a completely different ecosystem of service providers who can provide services over the top. So that's where the whole discussion starts. Uh, and why this discussion starts is because the OTT player, who are the service providers, have two-sided business model where they can actually charge both the advertiser as well as the consumers directly. 
whereas the telecom service providers have only one side of the business, which is consumers. So that's where I think that's the core issue, which actually but sir, has led to the bundle, demand of when you bundle with an OTT provider, which you there are many Jio and Airtel bundles on our set top boxes, etc. Is that not a two sided or whatever multi sided market construct in itself? The bundle that the telcos are offering to to some extent but not exactly the kind of freedom which uh, uh, the TSP or the internet But who is holding back have. that freedom, sir? Uh, uh, because you can't selectively charge, uh, say, uh, based upon the amount of content, the, the network investments required, you can't charge that. So it's because of the one-sided market which you have, the demand of fair sh uses has, uh, it's not an Indian phenomena, it's a global phenomena. But many countries have already, uh, I think, picked up that, Korea for example, Ofcom has also I think started working in that direction, EU has also working in that direction, even US has, uh, uh, has also worked in that direction. So it's not an Indian uh, per se because uh, this phenomena of decoupling is a global phenomena and that's how the business models would evolve and uh, the industry would go that way. Mr. Abbas, uh, Mr. Shankar, you have a word. Please. And Mr. Tivedi, feel free to jump in wherever you'd like. So, because time is running out, so I'll just make my final point. I think we will final. push the limits a little. Yeah, yeah. So, final point, because, uh, see, there are two, these are two things. Content should not be confused with the infrastructure issue. Because content is a very separate debate, and we can have a separate discussion on it. And who owns within government of India is again a separate issue, and it is, it doesn't matter at all. Because if it is in government domain, whether it is owned by one ministry or the other ministry is something which is determined by the allocation of business rules, so it is not. The, the conversation should be whether at all government should have any role in it or not. So that, that should be the conversation. So content is very separate from what we are discussing right now. The second issue and which probably we are discussing is the issue of infrastructure for uh, uh, taking this uh, telecom basically telecom infrastructure and the investments involved because of the emerging technologies. Now, the debate which was happening <coughs> and uh, as, as was mentioned that internationally, some countries have actually uh, progressed on the path of fair share. South Korea, for example, they started but they retracted. EU again has uh, done something and uh, USA also is trying to do. But EU where do we stand in India? Where do we stand in India? Just a last, last point. So I have done some back of, the pay, uh, back of the envelope analysis and I don't think in India this issue is relevant at all at this stage, at this stage. So I repeat that at this stage. Because the two TSP service providers, they are very well placed as far as their uh, profitability and uh, what we call the uh, profit before tax or profit after tax, whatever. EBITDA. So revenue to, to the profit is perfectly fine for both of them. <coughs> the other issue is about the network maintenance charges. And network maintenance charges around 25 to 30 percent for each of these two. So that is the current status. The profitability, wherever we see there is a red, is not account of the operational issues, but because of the legacy issues, because they may be writing off something or some, something or the other. So as far as India is concerned, as on date, we don't see that, we do, I don't see personally that there is a, a huge necessity or urgency for going for, uh, forward on this issue as a share, uh, sharing of uh, cost for the infrastructure that we want to create. But going forward, going forward there can be a need and as we said that it should be best left to the market to, to be determined rather than any audit based process because that will be very, very cumbersome and it will be very, very difficult to <coughs> adjudicate when there are litigations. Thank Mr. you. Dwayedi, would you like to add to that? Yeah, I would uh, actually take several steps back. Look at the way that uh, both these sectors, telecom and uh, television, evolved in India. Late 50s is when Doordarshan came into existence and for the first 35 to 40 years, it was all about terrestrial broadcast. DD set up its transmitters all over the country and that was the only mode that was available. Now, 
in the 90s, you have these private channels coming up, but for these private channels, setting up terrestrial infrastructure would have been a huge challenge. They would not have been able to bear that cost. So that's why they went set up, set up boxes. And they moved in that direction. Now look at telecom. Telecom started with you know, mainly urban services. You have a USO fund, subsequently mobile came in, and then you have the Bharatnet uh, project coming out of uh, USO fund. So the situation we are at and you know where where both the broadcasters as well as the telecom providers are arguing from is the position that has been handed to them by historical facts this is how my industry developed and therefore this is my argument what we need to do is to actually flip it on its head and see how is it exactly that the consumer wants that content to be delivered, or at least what is the most reasonable way, the most uh, logical way that the consumer could possibly consume that content. Now, you would, you would say that, okay, OTT chal raha hai, streaming chal raha hai, therefore it means that all people want is on-demand content. Not necessarily. There's a whole range of content, which is appointment content. If you, if you look at uh, sports, for instance, the World Cup ka match hoga to usi time pe hoga, usi din pe hoga. It's an appointment viewing. You know, you, you're watching it on OTT, you're watching it on streaming, you're watching it on broadcast as a separate matter altogether. People choose the medium based on what works for them, whether it is convenient for them, whether it is affordable for them. Even if you look at some of these, you know, the, the, the uh, people who are uh, putting out their content, whether it is entertainment content or podcasts and all, they are not dumping it at random. Stay tuned, next Thursday, 8 p.m., I'll come with my next episode, says your OTT. Is it on demand? Yes, the first round is appointment viewing, then subsequently it becomes on demand. So what we need to really do, I mean, if you were to get into the philosophy of it, you need to project and see what is the most affordable and convenient way for the consumer. You project that and see how the consumer is going to consume that content in the days to come. And then those make those approximate allocations between telecom and broadcast. Thank you, sir. Mr. Abba, actually, that consumer welfare standard does seem to be the most objective one given all the various dynamics at play. But Mr. Abbas, just to uh, Mr. Dwedi's point, there is also a history of regulation along with the history of these markets. And TRAI, fortunately or unfortunately, is saddled with that history as a victim of your circumstance and also as somebody who is living the mantra, hopefully, of maximum governance, minimum government. What would be your regulatory philosophy for infrastructure, and content, even if you divorce yourself from your institution for a minute. Yeah. So what we see uh, today that 80% uh, of the traffic which is flowing through the mobile network is video content. And uh, so large chunk of the capacity is being used in the video content. Uh, and these video contents are being provided by the content creators, maybe OTT players and others. So the consumer who is using, as said by Mr. Gaurav, the consumer who is uh, using the data, they are paying for the data to the telecom service provider. So they are free to use those data for any content or anything they want to do. So if they are devoting uh, the data to the 80% of their data to the video content, then uh, the network also has to support this. So basically, the telecom service provider are, are also basically earning the revenue through the consumption of those video content, which is the 80% traffic on the telecom network. So it is in the interest of the telecom service provider also that the consumer should consume more and more data. They, purchase, they should purchase more and more data from telecom service provider and consume it. And it is in the interest of the content provider also, OTT players also, that more and more subscribers subscribes to their content. And when they will subscribe, when they will have the mobile network facility with them. And 
availability of the network with affordability. If the prices are high, they will not going to consume the video content over high prices like in other countries. Since in India the prices are low, the data prices, they are able to afford the prices and able to see the content on this. So basically it's a win-win situation for both. It is in the interest of telecom service provider to expand the network, enhance the subscriber base, because they are earning the revenue on the economy of scale only in India, tariff is very low. And it is in the interest of OTT players also that more and more countries in more and more regions, the internet penetration should increase and their over the top content should be available to them. So the OTT players, they are also investing the money, but they have started investing in submarine cable consortium, then they are investing in uh, content delivery network, CDN network also. So if they feel that in a particular geography, there is a problem in internet penetration, and that is why their uh, content uh, reach is uh, hampered, then they may think of investment. So that is not an issue that they will not think of the investment in telecom network or telecom infrastructure. It is a need-based need things. So it depends upon region to region, it depends upon geography to geography, it depends upon country to country. So in India, since the telecom network is very robust, very available, affordable also, so the need they have not felt so far. But in the future, there may be a need that they will think that, okay, now it's required that besides investing in submarine cable, besides investing in CDN network, they also require to invest in the last mile also. So it depends upon the market situation and the market will play its role in deciding that what is required to be done. Thank you, sir. That uh, shows a lot of clarity of thought, uh, which I commend you for. Um, Nikhil, if I can turn to you and just ask you this question again, because you know it seems all very symbiotic and nice here. Uh, so again, what is fair? Why are people asking this fairness question in multiple circumstances where there's a product and there's a distributor. Just this week, we've been seeing the disputes between an app store and various products that are distributed on the app store. And this distributor, product, originator, conflict seems like a very is a legacy issue that should actually not permeate into the digital space where distribution is actually the USP of the digital space, right? It's supposed to enable easy distribution. So, so why this fairness thing everywhere cropping up in these debates? Because every marketplace wants to do rent seeking from creators. And that's been, in, historically it used to happen in, in mobile networks with value added services where increasing revenue share we used to be extracted by telecom operators. Now Google is trying to do the same thing to app developers. It's the same story. So the idea to do this fair share is the same game and it's basically rent seeking and extractive because most of these, are, like for example, So Airtel is it play, fair when Airtel people ask Google versus a, the other way around? On a, on a 41 percent EBITDA margin, which infrastructure provider in the world has a 41 percent EBITDA margin profit? I just want to say that we should remember the internet is a network of networks. It's not a cable operator sort of a business. They are telecom operators, are access service providers to the internet and anyone could be hosted everywhere. I'm a creator, I run a website. As a part of my hosting, I also pay bandwidth charges. What is happening is there's double rent seeking happening on the other side as a termination fee, which will basically mean in order for my service to be available to multiple players, I will have to go and negotiate all of them, pay everyone. Will I go to every operator in the world that where users can access my website and go and start saying, can I have an agreement with you to pay you? The internet doesn't work like this. It's a network of networks, right? So I think we have to remember that the internet is a very different beast, a very different game, and telecom op uh, operators are excellent access service providers. I like I said, I'm a big, I'm an Airtel customer. I'm very, f they have the best network. Geo has changed in that landscape. I'm a fan of both. This game is just basically to extract more revenue in the market. In even in 2014, Airtel used to tell uh, investors that we have made enough investments, we are profitable, there is no problem. And they used to go to the, op, uh, to the regulator and say, we don't have money for network. They're still, they're still around, they're still doing very well. The moment Geo was launching, 
Airtel put out an open network initiative to say how amazing our network is because they invested in the network because competition was coming. Maybe we need more competition in telecom and access because the same two players are dominant in wireline, wireless, and they are both getting into satellite. Okay. We need more competition. I think let content creators create, let access providers provide access to content. The two should not meet. Mr. Dwedi, uh, you are both. And I, I, I mean, I don't understand why actually in 2024 we are having these discussions about EBITDA and profitability. Uh, it, it is a market that most people are operating in. It is their choice whether they want to uh, incur expenditure, incur losses, garner profitability. There are certain operating conditions that are predefined. That is the history of regulations and policies. Uh, so in this context, sir, final word to you and there will be no word after this. No, uh, I would only mention the specific uh, circumstance in which Prasar Bharti operates and that is as the public service broadcaster, which means that uh, there has to be complete independence from any kind of restrictions to be able to take the public service message forward. Now, there are circumstances, the more, the, the more complex your systems become, the more liable they are also to failure. And we've seen that again and again, you know, uh, wherever uh, there are some natural calamities, for instance, in you know, different parts of the world. The telephone systems collapse, the internet collapses, you know, somebody sends up a balloon or something to uh, restore internet, but the basic radio signal, the basic terrestrial signal works. So just to take a point out of what uh, Abbas Sab was saying, the ideal system would not be where you, you know, restrict yourself to being wired or wireless. I would say from the consumer system, the ideal system, uh, from the consumer perspective, the ideal system would be that your device should be actually able to switch from telecom mode to broadcast mode, just like it switches from 5G to Wi-Fi when you enter your house. The day we've reached that, I think, you know, we've done it. Thank you to all the panelists. Um, this has been an extremely enriching discussion. Uh, competition, innovation, price regulation, uh, all of it covered in some sense. Um, hopefully, uh, those of you who are going back to Delhi, make your flights. And thank you again for joining us today.